like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. My name is Andrew, and today I'm not joined by Taylor, but I'm in his shed with Jared. And today's a special episode. Last year, we did the Andrew and Jared special, and we're back. The, the critically acclaimed Andrew critically and Jared acclaimed. special. Yes. One of the highest rated episodes, so we figured we had to do it again. And today we're talking about a pretty special topic to both Jared and I, photography and the materials that make it possible. Now, Jared, how was the first photograph made? So obviously, you know, the idea of capturing someone's image has been around forever with paintings and very different mediums. But the one that really began the accessibility to photography was the daguerreotype, which is, I may be butchering it, it's French, but it's definitely an interesting take and something that we'll probably never see again, in which they would take a copper plate that had been plated in silver, they'd shine it as much as possible, and then they would expose it to chemicals that would make it light sensitive. You'd put it in a camera obscura, and then the camera obscura would put an image onto it. Then you'd seal it with mercury fumes. Then you'd seal it again to make it not light sensitive. And then you'd finally have an image that you could look at. Yeah, and going back to there, it's pretty clear that chemistry and materials were a fundamental part of photography from the beginning. Before we had any of the fancy semiconducting materials that make easy you know, phone photography possible, it required the use of several chemical processes in tandem to actually get an image. And what's really kind of fun about photography, and uh, there's this quote from Dorothea Lange, she's a fairly famous photographer herself, uh, she said that a camera is a device for learning to see without a camera. I think when you start really getting into photography, I don't mean just doing you know snapshots on your phone, but when you start actually thinking about composition, you say, oh, I want to take photography seriously, it changes the way you look, right? If you're carrying your camera around with you, you start looking at small details in the world that you wouldn't otherwise pay attention to. You start thinking about things that are beautiful around you, things that are ugly around you, and it kind of teaches you to notice your surroundings more and also think about how you view them, right? Looking for different elements within the composition, different lines that you probably wouldn't see any other way. So I think photography as a hobby is really useful for developing aesthetic taste and being able to look more critically at things. I think nothing really emphasizes that better than uh, in high school, I took photography and my photography teacher day one said, stop taking pictures of flowers because we were, we were shooting black and white. And so everything that you see about a flower that you love is mainly color. And what's the point of taking pictures of color if all it is is just tonal shifts when you're in black and white? So it's really a new way to look at things because like, you're right. You stop looking for like what you maybe normally find pretty and start looking for those small details that make something truly aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, and you get to actually learn what makes something pleasing to look at as well. Yeah. Uh, black and white photography is really special, I think, because it does. you take away that color that can be often really distracting and you're left with just the root of the image. And then, you know, depending on how dynamic the uh the black and white photography is you get a lot of really cool tones in there uh, across the spectrum that's that's definitely something to note when we go back to the daguerreotype which is that since it was so primitive the colors are, are i guess well the black and white tones they're very muted there's not a lot going on there it's kind of just enough to let you know that there's a person there but there's nothing truly vibrant with it until it kind of goes farther on and then also they didn't have a lot of the light and composition stuff that we have now, so they look very weird, some of them. They don't look like a photo that you would want to take. Like, I know that this really famous one that you can see right here on the Wikipedia page, if you go look, which is uh, it's Abraham Lincoln, the entire picture is dark. Like, there's no light anywhere. There's just less gray in some places. Yeah, and that's, that's the fundamental material constraints. This isn't like someone being like, oh, I'm using negative space to... Yeah. This is, frame him. This is just that these are hard to take and then all the tarnish because they're using silver and copper. They're not exactly materials that are going to last forever. Everything's going to tarnish when you're using that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then also on top of that, like we kind of mentioned, is there's a lot of chemicals in this and it's dangerous. You're working with mercury or you're working with things that 
Now we know you shouldn't be working with, but back then they were just like, oh, we'll just rub it all over the place, see what happens. Yeah, yeah, they didn't live as long. <laughs> yeah. But they definitely, you know, they lived in different ways, really explored with uh, just all the chemicals, seeing what would happen. Got to yeah, respect that. <laughs> it ended up creating a wide variety of different processes. I think the primitive camera, you know, science and technology that most people are at least somewhat familiar with is film photography. Um, and this is really where we want to start this episode, talking about the materials and the chemistry that enables this to be possible. Hopefully at some point you've had the experience of using a film camera. When I was much younger, they had those disposable ones, and so I had no idea what I was doing, and so all my pictures were awful. But it's just a totally different process, right? You can't check your photos until you actually go and develop them, so there's more emphasis on the initial take. You have to think about all the different elements and compositional things and, as you take the photo. And the numerical constraint, too, because you're... It's always 24, 36. There's no unlimited takes. Like now when I shoot pictures, I'll take like 100 photos on my camera because I can just delete the ones I don't like. You don't get that with film. It is really a one and done thing. Especially yeah. with like the, the Polaroids and stuff, but that's a whole other thing we'll get to. And it wasn't that cheap either. We'll, we'll, we'll go into some of the cost constraints, but let's dive into what the structure of this looked like, right? So we have these thin film strips we put into cameras, and we'll start from the bottom. They had an anti-halation layer, or anti-halation, however you want to pronounce it. Essentially, this would absorb light that passed all the way through the strip and prevent it from reflecting, right? Because if you're using photosensitive chemicals, the last thing you want to do is have light reflecting now and creating additional exposure that you don't want. This also prevented the film from curling up. Um, you know, if you've ever gotten paper wet, you know, and it dries, it, it curls up. We wouldn't want that because it would be more difficult to process. It could cause mechanical failures within the camera. So that was that purpose. After that, we have this cellulose acetate backing, just a plastic backing to serve as kind of the, the main rigid component within this, uh, this film strip. Then we get to the light-sensitive emulsion layer. And finally, on top of that, we have an anti-scratch layer, something to try to protect the film before it gets developed, prevent it from any accidental damage. And then usually they'd have some sort of strip of paper on top of that. Well, um, there's also actually something kind of special about these layers, which you wouldn't notice looking at it until you're someone who's printing with it. So when you print with it, really they're only supposed to be printed one way. And the way you tell that is the fact that the anti-scratch layer versus the anti-halation uh, and anti-curl layers are different textures. One is very flat, no shine, it's all matte. And then the other one is very, very shiny and smooth, like uncomfortably smooth. And so that's how you know which side you need to put up when you start printing. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine you'd spend all that time trying to get the development right and then yeah, mess just up the printing because you put it the wrong way in. Now, how do we actually, you know, how do we actually convert light into something a little more tangible and imprint an image on here? Well, it goes back to that light sensitive emulsion. What's going on here? So effectively, there are silver bromide crystals embedded in here, which are highly light sensitive. In order to make this, they start with silver nitrate. So they'll dissolve these in water, they're highly soluble, and they'll just kind of let that sit, right? It's a nice solution with one of our reactants. Then, in a separate vat, they'll take ground gelatin, which comes from cowhides, and uh, they'll add a few other ingredients, and they'll heat that up and start stirring it to try to break it down and dissolve the gelatin. Potassium bromide will be added to that gelatin mixture, and then finally they add the silver nitrate. Now, keep in mind, all of this is being done in the dark, so... You know, it took some pretty highly trained uh, technicians to be able to do this because you're working with light-sensitive materials. So if you start exposing them to light, it's not going to be a good thing. So what ends up happening is we end up getting the precipitates of silver bromide. And because we're mixing this with gelatin, when we cool it down, we get a nice emulsion with these silver bromide particles dispersed evenly throughout it. So the gelatin acts like a matrix uh, that's holding all of these. Now, if you look at what silver nitrate looks like, you know, any of these silver halides, they kind of have this pale yellow appearance. And that's why film also has this appearance because of the, uh, the emulsion layer. But in preparing for this episode, I watched a German Kodak factory tour. It was all in German. There were subtitles, thankfully, because I don't speak it. But this was 1958. And so they're discussing all the processes. So all the employees have to put on these clean suits so that there aren't any contaminants that get in there. And right, this is 1958. So decade after the end of the World War II. So now we have all these radioactive concerns as well, and they actually were doing radioactive tests because various 
radioactive materials could damage the film as well, which I thought was pretty interesting. But when was all this taking place, right? Like, how did we get to film? What year was that happening? Did we just automatically get all these nice materials, or was there more primitive precursors? So there's a lot that kind of goes into it. As we first talked about, obviously, there was the daguerreotypes, which were 1839. And then there's kind of a while before we get to the next one. It's in the 1850s that they start taking photosensitive paper and using glass, and then we get the plastic in 1889, and it really isn't until 1908 where Kodak makes the first true like film that we're used to today, which is cellulose acetate film, and it's you know flexible, a little transparent, everything that you know film to be. Also, building on what Andrew said about how radiation can damage photography, that's actually something very interesting, which is any time that you take certain types of film through TSA, it's almost always best to have them uh, coat, like check for bomb coating, you know, so that they don't x-ray it because x-raying can damage it. And I did that once, and they were like, oh, there's, I think they said nitrate. They said there was something on it that was in bombs, and so I had to get a full finger testing everywhere to, like, make sure there was no <laughs> explosives on it. I was like, I'm just... I'm just, just trying your, to move it was my just your holiday picks. I was like, I'm just trying to literally. It was like I'm just trying to move my holiday picks, man. Why are you doing this to me? It was all like 15 minute wait. Typical TSA, right? Started with smoking, and now they're just getting rid of everything. Yeah, I know. How could they do this to us? Now that's also something that is really only concerned with like specialty film because it matters the ISO, what kind of film it is. So like most film you put through, nothing will happen to it. I've put so much film through x-rays, nothing. It was just this like one was something that I was worried was going to get ruined. So I put the extra care in. Yeah, there's a variety of different quality control measures that they end up placing on these. Uh, and you know, the process and what they're looking for kind of depends on what they're actually going for. As you were talking about with the film itself, they'll use different chemical compositions, different... Um, additives as well to achieve different effects. Uh, you know, trying to lower ISO, make it a more clear image, or make it more sensitive. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But you know, so they make this mixture, right? They have this emulsion. Then they have to slowly coat it on these plastic sheets, and then they also have to cover it up with the anti-reflective coating, and then eventually roll it up and put it in its nice film compartment. And this is all still being done in the dark. They're showing this guy. He's like changing out these rolls of, uh, you know, plastic coating, the anti-scratch coating. Right, it's these big rolls, and he's kind of doing something fairly technical to, to change it out in this machine. And the fact this is all in the dark, and they don't have you know night vision goggles on or anything, definitely speaks to the technical you know accomplishment of the people working in these factories. It's also really important to remember how thin these are. Like this is maybe even a little thinner than paper. This is not this huge gelatin layer. This is a very delicate process that they're doing. And then as you added in the dark too, like it's insane that they were able to do this. Yeah, and uh, when they would get them out, they would typically do a variety of um, tests on them to make sure that they're actually getting the effects that they want. So they would essentially do what's known as sensitometry, which is the science of measuring sensitivity. So what they would do is they would take a series of the material, and then they'd gradually increase the amount of exposure they would apply to various parts of this. And then they would measure, well, they would, after they would undergo development with the materials, right? But then they would measure the density of the silver deposit on each of them, and that way they were able to essentially create a plot of the amount of exposure versus the amount of silver that would be deposited. I just talked about silver being deposited, so I think now's a good time to actually dive into how this works, how we actually get a, a picture on these film. So, Jared, you have a film camera in your hands right now. Why don't you yeah. just take a picture and I'll explain the process. Here we go. Jared just took a photo there. Okay, so film strip has been passed into the, the designated area. The aperture, based on the settings he put into it, was opened and closed at a specific speed for a specific amount of time, and so photons from light have entered and hit the film strip. So our photon interacts with our silver bromide crystal. The bromide ion, it's negatively charged, it has excess negative charge. When a photon interacts with it, if it has enough energy, it can cause an electron to jump from the valence band to the conduction band, where it can migrate freely around the crystal. Now, if we had a perfect crystal of silver bromide, there'd be really nowhere for it to go. It would eventually just fall back to the valence band, no big deal, nothing. We wouldn't get any, any photograph from that. But what they'll end up doing is they'll do something called sulfur sensitization, where they intentionally are adding various defects to the crystal structure. And these defects, they refer to them as sensitivity specs. 
So the electron will eventually fall into a shallow electron trap state that's created by the sensitivity spec, which will cause the spec to become negatively charged. Now, a positively charged silver ion becomes attracted to the sensitivity spec and will start to form an agglomerate of silver there, right? More uh, electrons get freed, more silver uh, atoms migrate there. And what we get there is known as the latent image. Now, something really quick just that's important to know about film is obviously not all film, like we said earlier, is created equally, and you're going to have a lot of film that's different sensitivities, and that begins to manifest itself in what you said your ISO as, which basically just means how fast you want the shutter to open and close and how much light you want to hit it. So when it's a low number, it's very quick. You want just a little bit of light because it's very sensitive. The higher numbers, it's less sensitive. And they all have different things that you want to actually take a photo with when you select that film. Yeah, that's right. Instead of sulfur or some other defects, sometimes they'd actually put very small like gold particles in there. And the cool thing about gold was that you actually needed less light, less photons in order to actually trigger. And so for, let's say, a given exposure, you would need less, or let's see, in order to get an image, you would need less photons, essentially, right? You could do it with less silver atoms. So therefore, that would be a more sensitive film. So in dark, low-light situations, that might be more appropriate. What's really cool is that you can get an image with just four silver atoms on that sensitivity spec, which is which is crazy. And so it, it really goes to show like kind of the chemistry that's going on here. Now, this process is happening throughout the emulsion, depending on, you know, if, if photons are hitting it, right? Darker areas are going to have less light hitting them, so you're not going to see the, the agglomerate of sil metallic silver being formed. And, and that agglomerate is what creates what we call film grain, too. Because obviously as it gets more, you start to get those grainy images because it won't be perfectly fine. Except for there's like, you know, ultra fine film and stuff. There's a whole thing there, but we won't get into that. Now, obviously, you, you have this image. The question is, how do you get it from not being able to see it in a camera to being able to see it on a strip? And that is the process of obviously, as we all know, developing. I think that a lot of people get this image uh, when you're developing something, that you're in this red room and it's all like very secret and mystifying. The reality is a lot less interesting these days. Uh, you take the film, you stick it in a bag, you open it in the bag. And the reason it's in the bag is because this is a light tight bag. It usually has two to three zippers and layers to keep all the light out. Once you have that, you unravel it. You have like a li there's a bottle opener, basically, but it's specialty just for film canisters. You pop it off. Roll it on a reel. It's a very long process of getting on the reel. I used to suck at it when I started. And then once you have it in this light tight container that has liquid, that you can put liquid into it, you start the process of developing. So first, you got to soak it in water, and you soak it in water because it swells up the gelatin layer, and it kind of makes it easier to uh, do the next chemical treatments. And then you put it into developer, and you put it into developer because why, Andrew? The developer acts as a reducing agent, essentially. Okay, So we have uh, some silver that has formed on these sensitivity specs, but it's still amongst a bunch of silver halide crystals. So what happens is the, uh, b the function of the reducing agent is essentially to say, okay, wherever I see that there's a sensitivity spec, I'm going to create reduction and essentially try to leave behind metallic silver, which at that level is just black tiny specks. But... The thing is, because it's a reducing agent, it would also reduce some of the silver halide crystals that weren't exposed, right? So how does that work? Effectively, the silver that does form acts as a catalyst, which speeds up the reaction. So it's not that it's not reducing the areas that weren't exposed, it's just reducing the areas that were a lot faster. So timing ends up being somewhat critical here. There are different types of developers based on their strength. So an active reducing agent, as they call it, will reduce too many of the silver halide grains. So all the things that you potentially don't want to reduce, but a really slow one will just take a really long time. So if you reduce them too quickly, you get a low contrast image, but it's done a little efficiently. Now, if you do it too slow, you get a nice contrast image, very, you know, you get the, the image you want in nice quality, but it takes forever. So oftentimes they'll just pair these together. And also in, uh, you know, typical chemical reactions, there's a little bit of phys physical activity involved in this. You do have to kind of pick it up and shake it every once in a while to keep Obviously, new stuff constantly going over and moving things around to really get it to develop properly. Okay, so what's the next step then? So once you have it done, there's two ways to do it. Now, if you really, really want to be like precise about it, right after you put a stop bath, because a stop bath will instantly stop the action of the developer 
by introducing an acid to it. But if you don't care that much and you you can take a little bit extra over developing, you can just rinse it out, shake the water around, and just rinse it once or twice with clean water, and it'll do the exact same thing, just a little less effective. So essentially we're just trying to stop the yeah. re- reduction of those, you, uh, the unwanted reduction of yeah, those. Yeah, you just want to, once crystals. you've got that developing number that you think is right, you just get rid of the rest. But obviously, as you said, this is a still a very reactive thing, and the key now is you've got to make it not reactive, and that's when you add a fixer. And the fixer smells gross, gets everywhere, and is expensive, but it does a good job of stopping the image from being overreactive and so that you can actually now expose it to light once it's dried off. Yeah, and what the fixer does is it dissolves the remaining silver halide, so all you're left now on your film or within your emulsion layer is the the, the metallic silver, so these black specks. And this is black and white photography, naturally. So then after that, you wash it clean, get rid of any residual stuff, and you have your image. I think a common misconception, or, well, a common conception about film photography is that once you take your image, that's it. You're kind of stuck with whatever the exposure is. And, you know, people don't really think about editing the same way we, uh, we do today. But it was actually possible. There's this really famous photo of James Dean uh, from 1995. It was taken by Dennis Stock. But it, I'll include a link in the show notes where plenty of sources there as well. Uh, where, you know, Pablo Inirio, you may have heard the name, he does a bunch of post-processing stuff, so he marks up this image and talks about it, and then he uses this process that Jared can tell us about called... Um, burning and dodging. Called burning and dodging, essentially to lighten or darken different parts of the image in order to bring contrast and bring out certain elements. So even back then with film, they were still editing. But how does burning and dodging work? Well, first of all, if you use Photoshop, you may, be, you may know the word burning and dodging. And if you use the Photoshop, it's the exact same way. So... When you actually print a photo, it's kind of the same process where you're taking a, like you're taking the cell of film, you're exposing it to light, but this time the light is passing through it and projecting it onto paper. That paper is photosensitive just like the film was, and you go through the whole process of developing it. And you kind of workshop it until you find a number of time and a number of light exposure that looks the best. But, you know, obviously it'll never be perfect. So what you do is, you burn and dodge. And to burn and dodge, you mark up the places on a photo that are either too dark or too light. You look at it, and then in your mind, you imagine where that'll be on the piece of paper you're staring at. You take cardboard. That's what I use. You know, there's probably more professional tools. You cut holes in the cardboard, and then you shine the light through the cardboard in the holes on just the parts that are too light. That makes them darker. You go to the parts that are too dark. You cover the, that section with cardboard, then you shine the light on it again, and then that lightens it because less light's hitting it. It's not, it's a science, obviously, but it's not exactly the science when you're looking at an image and kind of just guessing because it'll never be perfect. It's just a constant guess of time. Like, there was times where I've printed photos 20 times before I was actually able to get one that I was, like, satisfied with. Yeah, and describing that process, it sounds awful and rather imprecise and if you look at Pablo Nerio's markings he's going to have to do a lot of that on this image if he wants to get what what he actually wants so there's there's definitely probably an art to it now you're talking about the actual printing process so hopefully we know that when you you get film right it's in the form of a negative so the spots that were light in your image are dark on the the film and spots that were dark are light so then when we shine the light through the negative on the you know the paper that we eventually want to use for printing it's now going to create the positive image, so the reverse. But that's how black and white film works. How does color film work, right? That's got to be a little more complicated, and it is. This functions exactly the same as black and white, except in this case there are three layers, and they have dye couplers. So you have your your base, right, your cellulose acetate, and then you'll have a cyan layer. This is a red-sensitive layer. Above that, you have a magenta layer. This is a green-sensitive layer. And then on top of that, you have a yellow layer, that is blue sensitive. Okay, so how does this work? They're essentially using subtractive coloring. So they take white light, and then by subtracting different colors from it, they're able to achieve the primary colors. So for instance, I'm taking a picture of something that's green. The layers that are going to be, you know, activated um, are the cyan and magic, or no, or yeah, the cyan and the yellow. And so that when light eventually passes through the negative that's formed, it's green that comes out because you've subtracted cyan and yellow from it. It works exactly like 
a printer has. That's the reason you probably recognize those three colors is because with those three colors, you can essentially create anything, which is similar to like how R- RGB works. It's the same kind of concept. They're just using different color choices. Yeah, exactly. And they have um, they have dyes coupled in them. So it, it, it's just a little more complex in the layering. And sometimes they'll have like nine layers I've seen. We can, we can post the picture when uh, this goes up. And I promise you it is complex and confusing. But all that matters is that it does work. With color film photography... The film's a little more complicated, so you have more layers, all these other intricacies. You don't want to mess up the dyes or you know break anything. So the development process takes a little longer. It's about 12 minutes, give or take, depending on it. But that's mainly for the subtractive one, which most of the really popular ones were, except for one, which is Kodachrome. Now, if you were around during digital photography or you're kind of an enthusiast, you've probably heard of Kodachrome. Some of the most famous color photographs were taken with this. Um, the Afghan girl picture, if you don't know that picture, I'm sure you've seen it. Go ahead and look it up. It's a really beautifully composed and colored photo. But Kodachrome just had this really nice color appearance. But what made it kind of interesting is that it was an additive process. So within Kodachrome, they still had those layers, but there weren't any dyes in there. Essentially, you were still just taking a black and white photo, and then they had to go through a very careful and proprietary development process where they would have to pretty much guess which layers were corresponding to what colors to try to get the the color that you were interested in. And so... Clearly, this had a lot of expense, right? A roll of Kodachrome in today's money would be $54, which is pretty expensive. The reason that it was so expensive was because it was sold with the development processing already in it, and that was kind of a big deal because basically what it meant is that you could only send it to Kodak. No one else was allowed to work on it, and it wasn't until a company ended up suing Kodak that Kodak finally agreed to start selling smaller people the chemicals needed to develop it because it was just something that they thought only they could do. Yeah, it was a Monopoly suit, one of the pretty famous ones. What I thought was really cool, a little antidote I discovered while researching it, was that um, it actually came about, it was actually put out in 1935, that's when it hit the market, but it its development was the brainchild of Leopold Godovsky and Leopold Menez, two musicians who turned into scientists at Kodak's research facility in New York, and they were just disappointed with the quality of color movie they saw in 1916 when they started and that's what kind of led them to this now we talked a little about how difficult and proprietary the development process is and because of those difficulties and the fact that you need to have specific machines and devices to do it nobody could maintain them not that many people were using it at some point so in 2009 2010 they ceased production they ceased any processing right if you still have Kodachrome film there's no way to process it anymore which is kind of sad because if you look at Kodachrome pictures they have this it's kind of like magic to them, like the way the colors are represented. It, it looks, they're, they're very comfy. But the problem is, you know, there's no way to actually get that. And one thing that's kind of interesting is that among, among the, uh, the Fujifilm community, uh, Fujifilm digital cameras, um, they have these things called film simulations where they essentially adjust all the different settings and the way it does color correction in order to try to simulate how these films were, were looking. And so you can go and you can kind of pretend like you're, you're shooting on Kodachrome, and it gets pretty close. It has to be tuned to the sensor and everything, but it does a pretty good job. And I think that's kind of an interesting way of looking at it, right? It's not the same as an Instagram filter or something where someone just adjusts all the the dials, right? It's based on the chemical limitations of Kodachrome, which I think just makes a fun, interesting way to shoot with, and I think the Fujifilm community has a a fun little outlet doing that. Yeah, it's it's very interesting when when you look at film because there is so many kinds. There is obviously, we just talked about Kodachrome. There is Ektar, which is something that makes it like very blues. There is Ektachrome. Kodak themselves makes such a wide array of different kinds of films that it is insane. And that's why something like film simulation, I think, is such a cool, like, new idea. And I'm glad that it's been getting more and more traction. Yeah, there's this awesome website called Fuji X Weekly. And this guy has like, uh, maybe a hundred different film simulations by now, depending on the different cameras you want. So even if you're not a photographer, it's kind of cool to go check out and see how people are trying to revive this in the digital era. Speaking of digital cameras, let's jump into how digital sensors work. But before we do that, we're going to do a quick cutaway and talk about some of the sponsors that make this show possible. When we get back, we'll tell you about how digital sensors revolutionized photography and enable us to carry around small little pocketable cameras that can take thousands of photos.
This month's episode is sponsored by Matt Match. Matt Match is a company that's passionate about material science and whose goal is to help connect materials engineers with materials providers and suppliers. Their platform has been used by over a million engineers each year, and best of all, searching for that material, that perfect material for your project, is completely free. So you can head over to mattmatch.com and check out how useful it'll be for your next engineering project. The next sponsor is Materials Today. The materials and sponsor. Oh. <laughs> The Materials and Podcast is also sponsored by Materials Today. You can visit materialstoday.com to stay up to date on the latest happenings in the material science field and read some of the fantastic articles that they have published. You can also head over to elsevier.com and find out more about their journals, books, conferences, related programs. I think if you're a material scientist, it's important to stay up to date on what's happening, and they have a lot of great articles that go into some great concepts that you can read, so go check them out. All right, so now that we're back from that sponsor break, let's get into really what makes the cameras that I imagine almost everyone is familiar with these days possible. Because obviously, turning what we just described as this incredibly complex process into something that happens at the click of a button and you can see the image instantly, there's there's some technological and some material wizardry that really goes into it. So let's get into how it happens when Andrew presses his button. See, first of all, Andrew's is nice and quiet because his is new it's electrical. There's so much going on. Mine is, mine runs off of like just pure spite at this point. It's from the 80s. It's got a lot going on in there. And also the film and a lot of things require more light than his will because my settings usually tend to have to be a little different than his because obviously unless he's doing a color simulation of the exact film I'm using, it'll never be the same. We'll never be able to take the same two photos. Yeah, that's right. There's, it's just like a total mismatch between like a chemical process and an electrical process. But how does it work? So digital camera sensors use these arrays of millions of tiny light cavities called photocytes that record an image. So when you press, when I took that picture of Jared just now, um, my exposure begins, my aperture opens and closes. And when the light comes into that, basically photons are able to enter and collect in these photocytes and generate electrical signal. Yeah, the shutter opens, photons come in, they enter all of these different light cavities right then it closes and so now the camera's processor is essentially calculating in each of these little spaces how many photons entered based on the electrical signal right and it's going to try to you know gauge relative to one another what's light and what's dark and so this is what generates our image right we eventually are able to get the pixels out of this and so at the heart of this sensor is the silicon pn junction so we take a p-type semiconductor excess electrons, you know, more holes, it's been doped, and we connect it to an N-type semiconductor with excess electrons. Okay, so we have a material with a lot more electrons on one side and then fewer electrons on the other, more holes is what we call them, and we put them together. Okay, so now imagine we connect a circuit and we create a path where electrons can travel out one end of the material and then go to the other. So electrons can go and recombine with those holes on the other side, and that interface between them they don't have to go there. So if we apply oh, what's known as a reverse bias voltage to the sensor, we essentially create a depletion layer. So in the middle, there aren't going to be any electrons and holes. We've effectively segregated them. And by doing this, we can now get a better assessment of the current that's generated from electrons because we know that they're only going to be passing through that circuit that we've created. So that's kind of the fundamental process behind how this sensor is working. Now, just really quick, obviously... We have given them so much free promotion, but let's talk just a little more about Kodak. They were actually the first people to make a digital camera, and the one that they made was made completely out of spare parts. And it was made in the nineteen it was made in nineteen seventy five, and it had an early CCD image sensor, and it was very primitive tech. And the best thing about it was, after the twenty three seconds of you pushing down that button, you got point oh one megapixels of image. Amazing. And obviously, you know. If you know what a megapixel is versus what you have today, you can see how incredibly terrible that image would be. 0.01 megapixels, that's pretty small, right? A megapixel uh, unit is a million pixels. So your phone takes about like 10 to 12 megapixel photos. Um, the camera that I use is 24-ish megapixels. You know, you go up to a full-frame DSLR, right? You might be getting 40, 50, 
Um, some of them actually, Fuji has some that are like 100 megapixels. And then, of course, you have scientific instruments, telescopes and whatnot. It's, it's even higher, more ridiculous, but that's pretty small. And those CCDs that you were talking about, they were some of the first to really come out, these charge-coupled devices. And effectively what they were was there was the silicon PN junction like we're talking about. And when photons would strike it, it would generate electrons. And so they would have in one going one direction uh, insulator strips. And on the other, they'd have aluminum strips forming a grid. So when light hit it, the electrons would jump into the aluminum and be trapped there. Then after the exposure, they would essentially just alternate current on these uh, aluminum strips and shuttle the electrons over where they would then be sent to an amplifier and the signal would be processed. So kind of like a slow, very involved process. The next iteration that's become more popular is the CMOS or complementary metal oxide semiconductor where there's an amplifier now at each individual photosite that I talked about. And so you're able to do local processing. So when photons hit one of those photosites, it's able to do the processing uh, of the data right there. All of your small digital cameras have them, really. CCDs are only really in special applications. Now, if we want to capture color images, we need some sort of filter to be placed over each of the cavity that permits only particular colors of light, so it's going to reflect, you know, red and green and only lead and blue. So essentially, we're actually reducing the amount of cavities that we can use to collect light in total when we're shooting color. And so we're discarding roughly two-thirds of any of the incoming light and so the camera ends up having to do this approximation of what the actual color was in that area. And so to do that, they apply a color filter pattern, and then they end up kind of revolving around that. But the most popular pattern is called a Bayer array. So if you imagine that we formed a grid out of these photo sites, um, let's do break it down to like a two by two square, right? Two of those squares on the corners are going to be green, and one of them is going to be red and one of them is going to be blue. And you're wondering why double the amount of green compared to red and blue. As it turns out, uh, our eyes are much more sensitive to the green colors. And so uh, an image with excess or green redundancy ends up creating one that appears less noisy to us and appears to have finer detail. So that's kind of the process there. And so after that, they do something called Bayer demosizing. I'm sure I mispronounced that. But essentially what they do is they form various two by two little grids and they kind of revolve over the all of the photo sites. So they'll end up having some overlap, but they can then use that to calculate the average color of that region based on how much was absorbed in each of the photo sites. And that's how they can kind of start to generate color. In order to actually extract the color that's being generated here, they do this process called Bayer demosizing. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but whatever. Effectively, what they're doing is they're kind of just creating these the, this grid pattern of two by two blocks as they're they're moving over this, and so they're gonna take those two by two blocks and then move over one block to another. So there's overlap, right? And they sort of average the color value that's generated by the four um, photosites in this grid in order to try to calculate an accurate color here. If you look at a real world camera sensor, I mean like a really zoomed in image. They don't actually, their, their entire surface is not photosites. In fact, they may even just cover about half uh, of the actual sensor area because they need to accommodate all the other electronics that are happening on the sensor, right? The, the amplifiers, the capacitors, and the wires that are translating the information. So this potentially means we're missing out on a lot of information in our, in our image. So in order to try to increase the efficiency, they implement these micro lenses there, which are essentially like little mirrors that act as funnels in order to increase the amount of photons that are captured within each photosite. And that way they can try to compensate for the fact that the entire surface is not photosensitive. And so they can try to bump the resolution and the information up this way. So there's still actually a, a quite a lot of it, you know, engineering work being done in this particular area to try to improve the amount of light that's captured in the processing. One thing that's kind of interesting is we talked about the Bayer array, which has pretty much dominated the market, but Fujifilm actually has their own process here. If you look at a Bayer array, let's say you move horizontally, you're essentially just alternating green, blue, green, blue, so there's no actual red signal. If you take a picture with a Bayer sensor of something with really fine lines or really fine detail, kind of near the resolution limit, you start to get all these artifacts and distortions there, and that's just because there isn't any red uh, and, and it's because of how repetitive the pattern is. It kind of matches up. Um, and so Fuji, to try to avoid, avoid this and fix this, created something called the X-Trans sensor. 
And basically, instead of doing this two by two grid, they do a six by six grid system where the corners are green and the center is green, and then two are blue and two are red, and it, it alternates. And I mean, point of the matter is, is it creates a more alternating pattern where they don't have these issues with fine details. And the other cool thing is, you know, to try to avoid these issues with a Bayer sensor, they'll actually put a low pass filter that reduces the amount of light that comes in and kind of lowers the quality. But because of this X-Trans sensor, they don't have to do that. So they can get uh, more, they can have more sensitive sensors, essentially. Now, obviously, we've spent this entire time talking about the materials and the chemistry that goes into creating the photo that you see. The first thing you need to do is get the photo to those materials. And what better way to do that than with lenses? And lenses are a whole new can of worms. If you thought that the science there was tricky, get ready for something new. The first thing that you need to know about is that they're focus-free lenses, which are just one flat lens that doesn't need any focus. It's a set length. There's nothing you can do to change it. And those are my favorite lenses because they require no explanation. They're just glass. (laughs) Yeah, when I took physics too, they did like concave and convex. I was like, all right, that's enough. But then you look at some of these lenses that you can buy and they have like 10 elements, so 10 different lenses that are all changing the length there. And now they can adjust their focal length and they can zoom. And the, the whole process and the math here becomes crazy. I dove into this subject thinking, okay, yeah, I'm sure, you know, Nikon, Canon, they have these nice little simulations where they just say, oh, yeah, I want a 23 millimeter equivalent focal length and uh, uh, it can zoom this much or whatever. And then the, you know, the simulation thing will calculate exactly what kind of lenses they need. Well, little did I know that it gets much deeper than that. Now, when we're talking about glass here, right, you know, this is superbly high-quality glass. It's not the stuff that's on your windows, right? For a lens to cost eight, $900 is not actually all that unreasonable. And that's, that's even for lenses that don't zoom, like prime lenses you can get there. I think, you know, if I'm looking at Leica, uh, which is a very high-end camera manufacturer, they, do, they have handmade processes for almost all of their lenses with, of course, some precise machining. They have lenses there that can cost $14,000, like it's more than a car. What makes the glass so special is not only the highly precise machining and processing of the glass, right? They have the cooling and the quenching down to like 0.001, uh, you know, differences across the glass surface, but they also add a lot of additives. So what are the additives going to do to glass, right? Is that going to discolor the glass or change the color that's coming in? The main reason is they're trying to avoid something known as chromatic aberration. If you've ever seen that Pink Floyd album where the light hits the prism and then diffracts, what's happening there is light dispersion. So light that's that's higher in frequency, so blue and purple, is getting diffracted much more than red light. And the main reason here is that within glass, um, you know, the atoms have their, their electrons going around. If light comes in with enough energy that it can promote an electron to a higher energy state, then it's going to do that. It's going to absorb that light, or it's going to create some sort of electronic structure in that region that is is different. So when blue light comes in, there's the potential that could be absorbed. There's the potential that it's going to interact with one of these these electronic structure that has been created because of just the, the electronic structure of the material, and it's going to slow down. It gets diffracted, and it bends more. Versus red light, the energy is not enough, so it just passes right through. The elements that they end up adding tend to be things like rare earth metals, things like lanthanum. And from my understanding, the main point of this is to try to reduce the amount of chromatic aberration by changing and manipulating the electronic structure of the overall glass such that there isn't any, inter- there isn't as much interference with the higher frequency energy bands. So essentially, they're trying to reduce the dispersion so that the, the difference when light gets reflected between red and blue light is minimized. Now, they're also trying to increase the index or the refractive index of the glass as well, right? Because if it has a higher refractive index, it bends light more, which means you can have a thinner piece of glass, cheaper, easier to process. So that's some of the reasons they try to add additives. Um, And typically, they have two kinds of glasses they'll use. They'll use crown glass, which that's trying to minimize dispersion as much as possible. And then they'll have flint glass, which is trying to uh, increased dispersion. And so they tend to put these things in tandem in, in very complex shapes in order to eventually bend light and get it to this perfectly focal point on your sensor. One other reason they add additives besides the trying to reduce chromatic aberration is 
it can lower the melting point of glass and make it easier to work with. So if they're doing intricate processing steps, they don't have to get it as hot, so it's safer to work with. The other one is to prevent reactions from occurring and various oxidation with some of the elements in there. In the search of knowledge about this topic, we were obviously trying to figure out why you want to add these rare earth elements. What do they do? And we came across this article, and it was, you know, a pretty nice explanative article. A lot of it made sense. And then we got to the section, and they're talking about the first ones they ever did. And the easiest way that they could add these rare earth elements was just to add thorium. Now, as we all know, thorium is radioactive. It's dangerous. It's not something you want to put next to your face constantly. And the company that was creating these lenses thought of that. They were aware that it was dangerous, and so they put a little star on it so that you would know that you were using thorium. That was it. There was no other yeah, real research. Just a little like, oh, asterisk. You're, yeah, you're also getting exposed, like harmful radiation exposure. And the other thing is this happens like late 40s. So right after, you know, everyone's they, under yeah, like they nuclear, knew. You know, fearing like nuclear bombs and radioactive threats. They're like, oh, yeah, just put the star on there. We'll deal with it later. These are like collector's items now. People will, people will actually try to collect these radioactive ones. I hope they store them safely. And we know you're wondering, the picture quality, not that much different. Yeah, and this really, was yeah. this was Leica that was doing this, yeah. by the way. You were risking health for a picture that was a little bit better than the ones that weren't dangerous. Now, this is still an active area of research. The trade secrets here are pretty safeguarded. Um, you know, you think of photography being like, okay, yeah, we got Canon and Nikon, but really, it's a highly competitive space. You know, one year one company's up, the next they're down. And it really comes down to this, you know, pushing the technology of optics and getting the clearest image at the lowest cost and removing these things. And so it's still highly competitive and an active area of research, both on the materials end and the physics end as well. And one of the really interesting things I found is the potential of using liquid lenses. Now, I'll just cover this pretty briefly, but, you know, with glass, if they want to focus on something, it involves a mechanical process of adjusting the various lens elements which you know, eventually will degrade those mechanical elements. So how long is, the, is it going to last? And also there's a speed involved, right? Like how fast can you turn a gear and get to the right focus? One of the new potentially interesting areas is the mm -hmm. idea of a liquid lens. So they're using electronics and magnets to try to control the basically the aperture and the positioning of different liquids relative to one another. And the advantage here is that they can focus like that. Like it's instantaneous and there's no moving pieces. And so a lot of manufacturing uses this. Right? Like if you have a bunch of jars of different heights, you'd have to completely adjust your focus all the time. But if it's instantaneous, it's, it's not as much of a problem. And so camera manufacturers are considering this as a potential option. The question is, is how expensive is it going to be to do that? I mean, it's just a liquid, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, that, that's I, I encourage best. you to look them up. I'll include a, a review article for people who want to spend hours learning about them, but that's not what this topic's about. Naturally, you put all this time in developing expensive glasses, it would really... Be unfortunate if just something as simple as a reflection kind of just caused stray light and just screwed up your whole system. So there's a lot of work that goes into anti-reflective coatings. Now, this really started back in 1866. Lord Raleigh, he had optical glass available at the time, and he noticed that it tended to develop this tarnish on its surface uh, as it aged. And so these are basically just chemical reactions that are occurring with the environment. But what he also noticed was that um, this tarnish has a refractive index between that of the glass and the air, and that it exhibited less reflection. And so that kind of created this idea. So they'll use all these different coatings on there to either create just two reflections that are less than what the total one would be, or to you know create textured surfaces that just break up the light and create just an ineffectual, destructive interference that uh, basically... They'll, they'll use different texturing to basically create destructive interference that renders any reflections kind of ineffectual or less harmful as well. And one of the really interesting ones that I came across is they'll, they actually kind of developed this out of look after looking at um, moth eyes. So moth eyes have this really weird property. Their surfaces are covered with all these natural nanostructured uh, films that eliminate reflections. And so this allows them to see in the dark, but it also makes it so that predators can't see them by the reflections in their eyes. So they have all these hexagonal patterns of bumps on them. And so the bumps are smaller than the wavelength of visible light. So light just kind of sees it as having a continuous refractive index. So rather than it being like glass to air, there's now this kind of weird gray area 
and it creates, it, it kind of prevents there from being any reflections. And so Canon actually saw this, and they put sub-wavelength structures similar to moth size on their uh, glass to reduce lens flare. And finally, we arrive at the end of our episode. If you listen to this and you were like, whoa, I didn't know so many materials processes were involved in photography. Neither did we. This ended up being quite the rabbit hole to jump down, and I learned a lot more than I ever thought I would. I think Jared did too. Let's say that at the end of this episode, you're thinking that you might want to get into photography. While there's a lot of different avenues you can take, one of my recommendations is to look for some photographers that you really like, some photography styles, whether that's landscape, portrait, documentary, and then start watching various YouTube videos and start reading forums uh, about, you know, how people shoot those, what equipment they use, the type of lenses and such. One thing I will recommend is when you're looking uh, at at what lens you're going to get, or what camera you're going to get, it's really tempting to get one of those big zoom lenses so you have a variety of focal lengths to work with. But what I've come to find is that although it's nice to talk about composition, it's actually a lot harder, and it takes a lot of practice to actually get good at it. What I like about prime lenses is that they force you to work in one focal length, and if you want to try to compose something, you have to zoom with your feet. It takes work and effort on your part to really get the photographs that you want It'll help you become a better photographer a lot quicker. So that's my recommendation there for digital. Now, if you want to get into film, I know that we did a great job dissuading you, explaining how complicated everything is. But I assure you, you can go to any thrift store near you. You can pick up the cheapest camera that they have there that's film. While there is, of course, you know, a more expensive camera going to be better, a lot of them will shoot pretty similar photos. You can even get a cheap point and shoot. I have three or four really cheap point and shoots that were donated to like schools and stuff and they work fine they work great the only thing that you're going to have to decide and obviously you can change it anytime you want is how you want to go about uh, printing them like personally uh when it comes to black and white i do go through the whole process of having them professionally printed but if you just want the photos and the fun of it all you have to do is wherever you get your film developed they'll scan them and it's usually like three or four dollars more and you get these really high res nice scans or if you're like me you don't trust people, drop a hundred bucks, get a really nice Nikon film scanner, and you're done. Yeah, I mean, it's become a lot more available. And don't try to worry too much about quality. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I need the largest megapixels possible in order to get a super clear image. If you look at some of the most famous photographs, a lot of them were actually kind of like lower resolution than a lot of the stuff we can shoot on our phones these days. What makes a great photograph is the story that it tells, the composition, the colors, you know, really focus on that. And you can get into photography pretty cheaply that way and produce just as good photos. And when you take photos, we hope you maybe appreciate the science that went into it because of this episode and realize that single click of a button you're doing, 200 years worth of science, thought, ingenuity went into creating it to be the best process it can be. And hopefully another 200 years. This episode required a lot of research and covers a lot of really deep topics. We only really scratched the surface, so I included all of the some extra ones resources and articles that I used, so including some extra ones. Definitely go check those out. There's the description, so definitely go check those out. There's a lot of really interesting, really good ones that are approachable from someone who might not even be familiar. As always, if you have any questions, please email us at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. We really like hearing from you, so please do so. If you don't like email, you can also reach out to us on Instagram. We post a lot of artwork on there. Uh, I personally make it, and I put a lot of time into it, so hopefully you go and check it out. Um, if you're bored, you can always just message us. Someone's bound to respond to you. But the other thing you can do to help us out is that you can subscribe to our show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you get it. And if you have the ability to leave a review, please do so. It helps more people find the show. If you want to also reach out to us on Instagram if you have any questions or maybe you want to see more episodes on this or like the lenses and stuff, we will always be happy to make new episodes about what you guys are listening to and we're always creating lists of new episode topics. So just let us know. Big thank you to Alphabot who made our transition music and Colobite who made the intro and outro. They both do a lot of really good work, so look them up with the, the signs involved. And once again, thank you to our sponsors Elsevier and Matt Match, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton. The makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials.